Okay, everyone, so thank you for coming. So this is actually going to be the, the final talk in the PyData track at PyCon this year. So um, we've got a special guest today. So because at the uh, conference in London earlier this year that I unfortunately couldn't go to, there was um, talks made by um, Michael's colleagues in, Py in PyData London, and they also did a hackathon. So they are from Full Fact, and as it says here, it's all about building automated fact-checking in Python. So please welcome Michael. Hi guys, uh, I'm Michael, um, and this is From Future Import Truth, or Building Automated Fact-Checking Using Python. Um, so, um, does that move things? No. There we go. So, uh, in this talk, I want to tell you a little bit about what fact-checking is, um, explain actually that fact-checking is quite hard, and show how Python can kind of help get over some of that difficulty. Um, so, what is fact-checking? And firstly, who am I? So, I'm Michael Skelly. I'm a software developer from London, but in my free time, I'm the tech advisor for a charity called Full Fact. Full Fact are the UK's independent fact-checking charity, um, and it's our job to help people make up their minds um, about the key issues of the day. Um, we do what other people just don't have time to do, which is look at the claims that shape the way we think, um, look at the issues that people go to vote about, um, look at the facts that politicians, that MPs and ministers use to make decisions on our behalf, take those back to their kind of real core base stats, the, um, the, the initial data, work out if it, that is the best primary source we can possibly find, um, and then stand up for the best data, publish it as far as we can, um, and if necessary, we get people to correct the record. Um, so there's a, um, a definition of a diplomat, which is someone who can tell you to go to hell and make you look forward to the trip. <laughs> a fact checker is someone who can tell you it's complicated without being patronizing and without making it more complicated. A lot of people think what we do is putting things into, into buckets, putting things into true or false, black or white, um, saying whether people are telling the truth or if they're not telling the truth. Um, but it, it's, it's very little about that. And a lot of what we do is re-injecting shades of gray into the all too black and white, um, oversimplified public discourse that unfortunately we all have, to, um, all have to live in. We monitor what's being said by politicians and in the media. Um, we spot claims um, that we think warrant further investigation. And then um, we go and check them. We check them against primary sources. We check them with experts. Uh, and then we publish what we've what we find. Um, we publish on Twitter, uh, and you can find us during election debates, during Prime Minister's question time, um, fact-checking live, um, so, and we try to get a tweet out kind of within about a minute of something being said. Uh, and we also publish on our website, um, which is at fullfact.org. We publish a couple of times a day. Um, and I can say, because I'm neither a researcher nor a writer, the articles are really well researched and really well written, and they're really, really interesting. So I urge you all to go and check them out. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to give a chance to you guys to become fact checkers sitting here in your seats right now. Um, so this is, this is something we use in our recruitment process, and here are six claims that we, that we saw in the wild, that we saw either uh, in the media or heard from uh, politicians. Um, if you've been to any previous full fact talks, you're ineligible for this. Um, so firstly, let's look at the first one. So there are record numbers of people in employment. Um, can you see anything wrong with that? Shout out, just shout out. What, what, what could be wrong with that kind of um, claim? Yes, exactly. There are record numbers of people, um, full stop. And so, actually, there have been record numbers of people in employment since about the 1990s. So this is not a very useful claim. And it's correct, but it probably doesn't tell us what we, what we think it tells us. And really, what we should be looking at is the, unemployment, the employment rate. Um, there are 600,000 illegal immigrants in this country. Uh, any ideas? How would you know exactly? So firstly, that is a very, very round number, and they've obviously been very careful to, not, not, you know, to stay on that number. But also, yeah, when did they line up so that someone could come and go one? So yeah, you have to ask, when someone makes a claim like that, how can you be so certain? How are you saying that with such a high level of certainty? Um, on average, people spend 10 pounds a week 
uh, on rail fares? Yeah, what kind of average? So, like, who are these, who are these people? Who are these people who are spending exactly 10 pounds? Um, is this just people who, who take rail fare, who, who take trains? Because if so, I want to take the same trains as them. Uh, or is this the whole population? Averages can be really, really misleading, especially when applied across a disparate population. Um, the average number of uh, arms for people in the UK is fewer than two. So you have to be really careful with stuff like that. 22 million people watched the election de debates in 2010. How did you count? Yes, but okay, let's assume that we can get accurate counts. Where did they watch? Where did they watch? Yeah, and I'm sure there are lots of people who re-watched because they're really exciting. Um, so the answer for this one is there were three debates. Each debate had about seven or eight million watchers, and so someone has just added up the numbers. So, I mean, that works. Oh, I'm going to have to keep on this. Yeah, that works. That works if you only watch, you watch one debate and then don't watch any more. Plausible, given the subject matter, but I watched all of them, so I should at least be counted. Um, we're spending more than ever before on flood defenses. Inflation. There you go. You, you, guys, are, you, you guys are all hired. Um, yeah, we're spending more than, ever, ever, more than ever before on anything, on beans. So, again, this, this is correct but it doesn't tell us what we, what we think. And really, we want to see that adjusted for inflation. And finally, local authorities in the UK spend 500 billion on street lighting. Over what time period? Good, good question, over a year. Compared to what? Compa yeah, compared to what? Yeah, w without, a, without a base, this figure is pretty difficult to, to understand. So the problem with this is it's three orders of magnitude out. It's a thousand times bigger than it actually should be. It should be 500 million. And to put that in context, to give it, to give it something to compare to, um, the entire public expenditure budget for the UK per year is 700 million. So to make this true, five pounds out of every seven spent would go to street lighting. <laughs> or for another comparison, uh, that's about four times what we spend on the NHS. So that's clearly wrong. And, you know, it, it, seem, it seems obvious, but that was, um, that got through a, a Daily Mail reporter, Daily Mail sub-editor, <laughs> Daily Mail editor, and it made it into the papers before that was spotted. Um, so, so that feels good, right? Like, using a little bit of base knowledge, using some intuition, um, we've got to the bottom of some, you know, real claims. And so imagine if you had a computer connected to the internet to the sum of all human knowledge, a computer that could zip through a whole database in like the, bl the blink of an eye, um, this, should be, this should be great, right? This should solve the problem, we'll all go home. Well, oh, it would. fact checking is hard. And uh, I'd, I'd like to illustrate that with a few examples. So firstly, in uh, November um, last year, there was a Prime Minister's Questions debate and um, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, made a claim to say that child poverty is falling. And Jeremy Corbyn made a claim to say child poverty is rising. And unsurprisingly, people were quite keen that we got to the bottom of that. And so we asked their teams, looked into the figures, and guess who was right? They were both right. And because in this case, there are two measures of poverty. There's relative poverty and there's absolute poverty. And they're both real measures. And both of what these people have said is correct. But it's not, when, when you say child poverty is up or down, you think, well, there's going, to be, there's going to be one clear definition of that. So you can imagine for a computerized fact checker trying to decide if the claim child poverty is falling is true or not, there's already a problem. Okay, what about something simpler then? What about something, you know, we know that words are all like wibbly wobbly and, you know, people's understanding of words differs. What about something that we can quantify pretty well, that we have a pretty good idea about what we mean here? This is a graph of the population of the UK over the past century. So you can see that in the kind of the 19 teens, there was a drop, obviously around the First World War. But in the kind of 1940s, there is no drop. Any idea why? Refugees, good idea. Anything else? Methodology, yes. Exactly. So, in the First World War, soldiers stationed abroad were not counted as being part of the population of the United Kingdom. 
then that's why you can see after the war, they return again, whereas that didn't happen in the Second World War. So without that piece of information, it's really, really hard to make comparisons. Even though this seems like a really simple graph, you can't make like-for-like -like comparisons between these two periods because the methodology changed. Um, and if you don't know that, then when you say something like, here's the figure adjusted for uh, population, are you really sure what you mean? Can we really count on those kind of data? Here's another example then. So after the population shoots back up when the soldiers return, it drops again. Any idea why? Flu, Spanish flu, good idea. Any advance? Methodology change? Not quite. Same methodology. So what happened here is this is the Irish free state leaving the UK. This is not the same country at the start of the graph as it is at the end of the graph. <laughs> and what's worse, these, these things, these caveats are A, very rarely available. And if they are available, they are not available in a computer readable format. So given that, the, the problem for a computer seems pretty high in even just giving very, very simple statistics about something like the population of the UK. So how, how can Python help? When I talk about um, automated fact-checking to people, I think people often think about this as, as the, the problem space, automatically checking a claim and returning a yes or no answer. But really, I think it's more part of a broad spectrum, starting at what, what should we check? What are um, what claims exist, what would be the most important for us to check, which, which are being repeated frequently, automatically checking, which partly might not just involve giving a yes or a no, but surfacing the relevant data, all the way to spotting the claims that we already know the answer to, that maybe the humans have looked at, um, they've come up with the right answer, and we have seen people still citing those claims. So, are human fact-checkers going to be uh, replaced by automated fact-checking? We think not, and this is a quote from Andrew Ng, which is very well used, but I, I, it's excellent, so I just want to uh, share it with you today. The Industrial Revolution freed humanity from much repetitive physical drudgery. Now I want AI to free humanity from repetitive mental drudgery. And we think this is what we can get from automated fact-checking. We're not going to replace a human fact-checker because things are hard. Fact-checking is hard. Facts are hard, facts are slippery, but we think we can augment them. We think we can give them tools to enhance the ability, their ability to check facts, to surface that information, to regularly pull in the most recent data from the sources. We think we can stop the spread of misinformation, things that we know are incorrect, or by identifying the things which are spreading faster and checking them sooner. And we think we can give tools to journalists and the public so that they can start checking the facts themselves at the point at which they hear them, rather than having to wait and then come to us for the truth. So, without further ado, I'd like to do a demo. So, over the summer, I joined Full Fact for a period to try to build uh, the first kind of proof of concept that we could get a system using you know, available technologies um, without using a huge research team. Could we get a system that could radically make a step change in their ability to do automated fact checking? Um, so I don't know how to use a computer, though. Uh, does that work? So this is what I built. Uh, we've got two products. So one is called Live. Oh, where's my eyes? So Live um, takes subtitles, takes a feed of subtitles um, live. This is a recording from Prime Minister's Questions um, last year. Um, but it will take a live stream of subtitles and um, in real time detect are there any claims that, um, for, with data sources that we already know or are there any claims that we've already checked. So here's the claim about um, hospital trusts um, so that they can in real time spot that and tweet that out as quickly as possible so that the debate can be informed um, and, uh, and viewers can understand what's happening. Um, We'd also like in the future for this to be um, put in the hands of journalists so they can be at a press conference and they can hear a politician say, unemployment is rising. 
and instantly get a graph of, of unemployment figures um, live from, uh, from the Office of National Statistics um, so that they can make their own mind up and they can put this to politicians. Um, yes, what you said is correct, what you said isn't correct. Here's the data to back it up. We have a second product called Trends. Trends is to help us stop misinformation in its tracks. We look at the claims that we've already checked and see, are there sightings in the last seven days? And we can see them broken out as to when they started and how, how they're going. And also look, if we, make, if we make an intervention, if we put out a press release, does that make a, make a difference? And we can also see the source of the claims. Um, and there's a good story about this. There was a, um, a really rampant claim about a 38 billion pound black hole in the defense budget. Um, and it was, it was all over. Um, and once we plugged into this system, we realized that half of all the instances of this claim were coming from one man, Frederick Forsyth. So we took him out for a steak dinner and explained that this was not correct. Here's the figures behind it. And he stopped saying it. And that, that, cla that claim dried up. I don't know how to get this back. Okay, how does it work? So, we are monitoring right at the far side. We are monitoring subtitles live, constantly across a bunch of different channels. Um, in the UK, we are really lucky to have great subtitles, um, but they are still really hard to get hold of. And part of our system, not pictured, is an aerial attached to a TV tuner card, attached to a Raspberry Pi, doing OCR live across loads of different channels. <laughs> we're also monitoring media sources. We're monitoring what is said in Parliament. And we're starting to monitor um, media sources across the globe as well. And we, we consume about um, you know, millions of sentences a day into Elasticsearch, and that feeds our repeated claim detection, which basically it tries to go through that corpus and try to find, is there a sentence that's semantically equivalent to a claim that we've already checked? On the other side, we've got our claim checker, um, and I want to reveal a super secret algorithm behind this. So to check a fact, and this is what a human fact checker does, so it's not that secret. First, we pass the sentence. Um, we use Stanford's NLP library, core NLP, um, which give us this break, great breakdown. Uh, and you can see we've got this kind of like subject of GDP, which has fallen. Um, we can see that that's modified. The fall has been modified by some, some percentage. And that percentage is even qualified by some other bit. And it's helpfully pulled out that we're in the UK, that we've got the percentage and the data up there. So there, from there, we try to identify what is the claim in that. And a lot of sentences don't have a claim. So we try to find claims in a format that is common, repeated, and there's lots of statistical claims that are in a very, very similar format, and get that in a way, oh, that's quite hard to see, get that in a way that um, we can pass that on and, and check it. So here we've identified that fell is a decreased kind of verb. We've identified that it's talking about GDP. It's in the time frame, 2009. And we've even identified that they've used the adverb dramatically so that maybe later we could work out is that a reasonable adverb to use? Not currently a feature. Uh, after that, we gather relevant data. And I've already explained how data is, data is tricky. Um, and so we are being really careful in uh, hand-selecting the data sources that we know we understand the caveats for, um, that we trust, and that we can understand the limitations of. Um, and then finally, we try to synthesize from that data a conclusion. And so th this, is, this is the um, conclusion for the claim, uh, I think GDP is rising. And you'll see there, are, there is a little bit which says true. That, that features, but there's a lot more stuff. And that's because I think for us, giving that context is really important. And in this case, if someone says GDP is rising, we can say, oh yeah, well, that, that is true, that is true. But are you talking about per quarter, based on the last available data, or split by year? Um, and that's the kind of detail we think is really, really important for us to be a trusted system um, and for people to take this and not just say, oh, great, the computer says yes, computer says no, but to look at it and make a judgment for themselves. Um, so that's what, how all the system comes together. And we've got a Flask API on the front of it um, connecting to our front end. 
and we hope pretty soon to use that to also develop some tools for journalists um, and hopefully eventually tools for the public to, um, to do fact checking maybe from their own homes. So um, that's it. Oh, a final word, we're hiring. Um, and if uh, we're looking for someone to help us join and make those products, um, so if anyone's interested or you know someone who might be interested, send them to fullfact.org slash about slash jobs um, and help, help them help us fight misinformation. Thanks. Hi, Michael. Thank you. That was an absolutely fantastic talk and a brilliant way to end the uh, PyData track this year. So thank you again. Uh, I'm just trying to think how epic everything would look if we really did spend half a trillion on uh, street lighting. <laughs> Very well. It'd be like it. Tomorrow World or something like that. But anyway, I'm sure, that, I've no doubt we're going to have some questions. So we've got, we've got time. We've got about five minutes. So who's going to... Oh, there's so many hands. I'm just going to come and try and do it in the best, most practical way possible. Thank you. So, uh, have you got any GitHub projects I can contribute to as a volunteer? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, the first thing that would be really useful for us, um, we, ran a, um, we ran a hack day at um, Pi, uh, Pi Data Conference in London um, earlier in the year. Wait, yeah. Or was it last year? Anyway, um, and we got some really fantastic projects coming out of that looking at our matching, um, but also in our monitoring plugins. Um, the more that we can monitor, um, the better the coverage we can get. Um, someone knocked up a, uh, a Twitter monitor so we could plug in um, the lists of um, candidates and MPs' uh, Twitter profiles so we can monitor what's happening there. But yes, please get in touch. And um, we have, like, as you can see, it's like a really modular system with like loads of interesting little parts to do and like everything helps. So yeah, please get in touch. Uh, you were just saying that you have a Twitter monitor. Yes. Do you, and uh, you check facts that you've already checked, if you spot a something or, well, a fact that is wrong or needs additional information, do you then go and automatically reply to it, either saying it's wrong or needs the additional information? I thought you might ask that. So <laughs> that is that's something we thought about a lot. Um, and it's really appealing, but context is super important. And so, like, for instance, if someone says, it's not true to say this, GDP is falling, or whatever, um, but also in loads of other different cases where it's more sensitive, um, we, don't want, we don't want to be plowing in and saying, um, oh, God, you got this wrong. Um, so for now, um, we're, we're trying to use this in a way where it is you know, additive only, where it's helping us or it might help journalists and they will still do some judgment as to is this, you know, is this relevant um, before actually plowing ahead with it. Um, but yeah, it, it's a great use case. So is it possible to use your systems with our own A fact database or B on a, to integrate the fact checking so that we can do responsive kind of feedback, uh, just like Twitter, but in our own applications, our own use cases? Yeah, so, um, so, uh, depends on what you're, what you're trying to do, but we want to, so first off, we're making tools internally um, to help our fact checkers. Our next stage is we want to take this out to the wider fact checking community. And we've got really close links with guys as far as Argentina and South Africa, um, and we're gonna start rolling out with them, putting it in multi-language, and yeah, adding the option to add new data sources um, to be monitored. Um, and then, yeah, as, as we scale out further and further, um, yeah, I think loads of new applic applications will come, come available. Um, do you think this, is, this gives politicians uh, and newspapers and agents in privileged positions sufficient incentive uh, to not mislead the public? Or do you think we need to make um, lying to the public illegal or um, have financial consequences if newspapers you know, lie? So the problem is lying is a very strong word. And a lot of time, what, what people will say is 100% correct. And they could show you exactly why it's correct. Um, and sometimes what we do is say, well, that is correct data. We can back that up. But that is probably, when you hear that, that might not be what you're thinking. Here is some more helpful data. And then you make up your mind. I think if you do something like that, you'll probably catch very few people because um, people are typically using correct figures, 
but just in ways that are, you know, even, even could be substantiated either way, um, but the, then there's two sides of the story. And what we try to do is show two sides of the story. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, I think the, um, the better way to do this is to let the public be more informed about what the alternative sides of this are, um, rather than trying to, like, have some global arbiter of truth. I think there are some cases where you can definitely tell they are lying. <laughs> we wouldn't do it. Yeah. Anyway, I think we've got time for one more question. So, we'll... um, How do you ensure that the data that you're using as a reference source is up to date and that you're not misleading the public to keep your trust? Yeah, that's a really, really important question. So firstly, all the data we use um, comes from official government statistics. Um, and uh, we're working really closely with them to A, make sure that they, the quality of the data is really high and also that they increase the, the, the amount of data that they have out in a format that is sufficiently high standard with all the caveats there that we can use it. Um, and then the second thing is to not just, not just show the data, but you saw, or you might have seen at the bottom of that graph, there was, there was the link to the original data source. And we always link back to our primary sources so that you can go back and, yeah, if, if, if we made a mistake then, Great, please, please tell us, because um, I think really we're, we're not looking for us to put people to put blind trust in us instead of other people. We're saying we're going to gather you the information so that you can make your own minds up. Okay, well, once again, thank you so much, Michael. That's brilliant. Thanks.